you know, uh, <clears throat> I w- I'm very close to university, uh, and I was having to buy uh, lamb meat for my wife. Ah. Uh, mm-hmm. <laughs> I was in my office, and she said that you have to bring them because she's cooking something specific <clears throat> to Turkish, Eastern uh, Turkey. So ah. I have to, with, uh, yeah. Well, she's so, the uh, boss. She is the boss for today. <laughs> when it comes, when it comes to the dinner, <laughs> <laughs> we share we share responsibilities. A democratic house. That's right. <laughs> That's right. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, thank you. Are you are you living in Georgia, Mr. Edward? Oh yes, Gory. Gory is our home. Oh. Okay. Come. Oh, we have a lovely awesome. home here in in Gory. Okay, we will um, we will pay you visits then. Mm-hmm. You're welcome. Okay, uh, I will I'll get you email and and maybe we can. Okay. Are you going to visit Ipsu later when you will have time for that? Because we work and you know we can just host you at International Black Sea University. Mm-hmm. I love the International Black Sea yeah. University. I have we're taught. We're waiting. The... We're waiting for you. I have taught there. I I taught uh, international law. Yeah, uh, taught. Uh, uh, I yeah. don't know what all uh, mm-hmm. uh, English literature, Great. and economics. Mm-hmm. Uh, oh, do you think right? time, it's time to start? Or yes. Something? Yeah. Okay, let us start. Please. Okay, so we'll start with me, and let me see what how I can do it. No. Do you do you wish to share the screen? Yes. How can I do it yes, with it? With uh, do you see three points at the bottom of yes, the screen? Yes, I can see that. Yes. Next to next to it, next to it, there is screen. You can click here. Present now. It's written. Present now. Next to three points. Uh, yes, I can see that. Is it presented? Oh, no. Can you see it? Click here. Then you know your entire screen. It's written I did. Entire screen. Then screen appears. You will click there and share. Click to that screen and share. And, and it gives it, you three it. options. So whether you want to share a link or window or present PowerPoint. Uh, it says that I cannot use it in a way. So let me let me do it again. Um, yeah, you will just click to screen, then your entire screen, your entire screen. I did it, but... I, then, you know, screen work. appears. If you won't click to the screen, you cannot share. Small screen appeared there. Click there and then share. Yeah, uh, I did um, the full screen. Uh, but full, uh, just a moment. I think I'm doing it now. Can you see my my? Uh, yes. Yeah. Can you see it? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay then. Let me see a splash. Share it. But the PowerPoint uh, may take some time. It's kind of a technology. I don't know what's going on. But I think it'll be okay. Because. Uh, all right. So you can see it now. Yes. Good. Right. Let's start then. Um, we're going to talk about art and design national identity in interwar Greece, which was very um, important historically in terms of art and design period. But let's start from the beginning. Everything starts with the Asia Minor disaster of 1922 which was a very important phase of the interwar period for the country and which created the need for a national self-affirmation and of course it was expressed by a turn to tradition in general it is then that uh, the nation is no longer understood geographically but as a cultural entity that aspires to expand its spiritual horizons by being open to dialogue with other countries, other nations in the world. And in this shift, um, the view of the nation 
is one of the key features of the generation of the 30s. And what's the, the generation of the 30s? It's um, a group of writers, po po poets, and visual artists um, which started creating uh, from the 20s. And of course, in the 30s, their work started taking shape. It's a uh, generation is also called the interwar generation, established a new belief based on the concept of Greekness, which was formed according to <laughs> history, tradition, and memory of the Greek nation. The idea of Greekness refined and repelled the abstract forms of modern art in general, but not all. Okay. And um, be mainly because they threaten the identity of Greek art. Uh, during that period, Greek painters discovered the symbolic world of Byzantine painting through the abstract forms of portable icons and murals, the decorativeness of folk art through naive painters of the time, as well as the harmony and balance of classical art. In short, they tried to maintain their Greekness in terms of authenticity through the long history and tradition of the Greek nation by separating and sometimes embodying elements from contemporary European arts. Constantine Parthenis uh, is one of the representatives of uh, this generation. <laughs> he was an exceptional artist from Asian Minor who sought sources of inspiration exclusively in the Byzantine and the Eastern tradition, but also from antiquity and other modern movements and styles. Another one was Otis Kondoglu. He was from Asia Minor too. Uh, of course, as you can see, he gets a lot of his uh, inspiration from uh, Byzantium, but at the same time, he is represented to ancient hero, ancient Greek heroes, you see? This one rejected actually any contact with Western art. His charming personality and invented ideas were to influence many artists of the generation of the interwar period. Another one is George Gunaropoulos. His works had a transcendental character. He used to draw faded figures, as you can see here, just with a few simple lines, free from unnecessary details. His works were dominated by themes from classical antiquity. As you can see here, this one, I think, was painted in the Athens uh, mayor house. Female figures, trees, and still lives that blend into poetic myths. In this period of historical and political upheaval, the great pottery industry, the only type of mass production industry in Greece with artistic potential, started being deeply influenced by this new aesthetic and ideological trend, but also by the storm events of the time, and so thereafter started integrating the concept of Greekness in its production in a different way. It also has to be said, stated that the contribution of many Greek potters who were refugees from Asia Minor in shaping the physiognomy of the new Greek ceramics was particularly important. One of them was the talented potter Hippocrates on the Basoglu, a refugee from the former Greek Asia Minor who founded Kerameus, one of the most important pottery factories in the 1930s, in a remote suburb of the city of Piraeus. In the late 20s, he started running his own workshop in Korydalos, that was the suburb, where in addition to functional ceramics, he also made copies of decorative archaic vases, but in a limited number of production. This constituted the beginning of the identification of ceramic art with the need of the Greeks, especially the refugees from the Asia Minor coastline, to discover the roots of their ancestors, seeking their national identity they had lost. Um, the Kramas uh, factory was built in the early 1930s. 
and its production far exceeded the production of the first workshop, as it included a wider range of functional ceramics such as plate, jugs, vases, glasses, basins, ashtrays, supermins, and all that stuff. It also included a separate art department specialized in the production of copies of archaic vases, wall plates, as well as other decorative objects depicting scenes from the Greek antiquity and folk tradition, all hand-painted in an astonishing manner. This was by no means accidental, as from a purely technical point of view, the refugees were the first to bring to modern Greece the technique of ceramic vases and plates painting, as until then the local pottery production was limited to simple and functional objects with little or no decoration at all. All factory products were distinguished for their visual characteristics, both in terms of form and decoration, emphasizing the importance of Greekness as a necessary concept for the formation of the national identity ideal in Greek art, society, and culture of the era. Much older than Kerameus was the pottery factory of Keramikos, which was founded in 1909, that is about 21 years before, uh, with specialization in the production of plain bayans, uh, dishes and plate in general, with the characteristic logo of a marble bull from the Dionysius of Colitos Prensict, which constituted the ancient Athen Athenian symmetry of Keramikos, the most characteristic sculpture. Uh, in the 1920s, the company decided to deal with handmade artistic ceramics. During this period, the contribution of refugee uh, women from the area of Kitahia, uh, famous for its ceramics, was remarkable. Uh, can you hear me? Um, can you still hear me? Yeah, yes, sure, yes. 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 Yeah, we're okay, just yeah, we don't Thank want to interrupt. Okay, because I'm not sure because of the connection, sorry. No, 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 it's very interesting, yeah. Well, thank you. Most of them, along with the neo-archaic rhythm, as well as the folk rhythm, which drew things from Scyrian, Rhodesian, Cretan, and Aegean motifs, introduced a new oriental style with Byzantine features, which was, however, less popular than the other two. During the 30s, the Keramikos art department began to develop more and more, as it was then the, that the important artists from Greece and abroad, such as uh, um, uh, Depian or Max Elstern or the Greek, the famous Greek uh, artist Ioannis Simonakis, were hired as managers of, the, of that department. Perhaps the most active and skillful of the three was the Greek one, Simonakis, as his artistic work was combined with his research interest in general. What he did, he often visited Greek and foreign museums, and with special permission, he copied several scenes from ancient Greek vessels and amphorae, which he used for the factory production, and soon became the main inspirer of this popular neo-archaic rhythm. However, uh, the most important personality in the artistic course of the factory was the famous ceramist Panos Valsamakis, a French art school graduate whose work was distinguished by an outstanding artistic approach in terms of bold and intense forms, um, especially of the figures but also for its color variety that were very rich in color. In terms of thematology, he was inspired by the lost homeland in Asia, a minor, the Greek tradition, and the Greek nature itself. His works were distinguished for their high artistic value, which was the result of their intense narrative dynamics. And specifically, the ethographic scenes he depicted reflected his intense romanticism and his effort to idealize Greek 
uh, rural life and nature. Additionally, the impressive painted techniques he used transformed the uneven surface of each ceramic object into a white painting canvas. Since he was an artist equal to the visual artist of the third generation, <coughs> excuse me, he uh, produced um, a work of refined expression that reflected not only his sensitivity and European education, but also his vision for the Greekness concept, restoration in Greek art, and therefore the implantation, you can say, of national identity ideal in Greek people's consciousness. And I'm talking about the Greek customers in that case. Now, the third uh, case studies uh, has to do with another factory, the Kutakia factory. Um, again, in uh, Neophalia, another pottery factory was established in 1930 by some Greek pottery refugees from Kutakia, uh, which, as I told you before, uh, was a city in Asia Minor which was very famous for its rich ceramic tradition. Through this important business venture, the experienced potters transferred and incorporated in the idea of national identity designs, colors and compositions taken from the Asia Minor tradition, since they claimed that they constituted part of Greekness and in fact, part of the cultural identity of Greeks who lived for whole generations in the cities of Western and Central, Central Asia Minor and in the Istanbul itself. Most of the designs used by the factory craftsmen were transferred from respective um, Kutakia workshops and were carefully collected so as to create an imaginative source of inspiration and that helped in the creation of objects such as plates, bowls, um, bottles, vases, candlesticks, and glazed tiles that became unexpectedly, unexpectedly popular, like this one. Uh, it also should be noted that uh, although most of the designs and patterns had several influences from Islamic art, and specifically from the ethnic type uh, ceramic decoration, they were in their majority Greek motifs, um, especially created for ceramic decoration. Except the ethnic type objects, the company produced uh, uh, an extensive series of uh, decorated plates and bowls and all that stuff, with uh, decorated with archaic themes, as you can see here. Uh, just um, following the fashion or the trend of the time, or the, let's say, the ideology of the time. Um, however, the company was very much um, distinguished, not for all that, but for its tiles production. And the tile production would finally prevail, especially in the architecture field. During uh, the th 1930s, the, the colorful glazed tiles that were produced started decorating the facades and the interiors of many public and private buildings and started also blend harmoniously with the classical architecture of the time, transferring memories from the Greek Asian minor culture. The National Bank Archives Building in Athens constitutes a wonderful example of modern architectural eclecticism, which seems to incorporate impressively in its facade a wide, long, as you can see in the middle, horizontal strip decorated with tiles of the factory Kitachia in a repeating spiral pattern in cobalt blue. Uh, this frieze is combined with the vertical tile columns of the facade made by the Keramikos factory uh, and constituted a generous first attempt of the Greek architects um, excuse me, uh, to promote the pioneering achievements of the brand new Greek pottery industry. Uh, 
Ceramic tiles were also chosen to decorate the classic propylon or vestibule of the National Bank branch in Vathi, in the Samos Island here. That was in the early 30s. Despite the fact that the exterior of the building was decorated with tiles bearing elements from the Minoan times in Greek mythology, as you can see here, bank managers' first floor residence fireplace was completely covered with Isnik style uh, with Nick style tiles made in the Kitaki factory. I'm not sure if I, have, I don't have the, the, um, the slide, sorry for that. Um, now, regarding the interior decoration of uh, the most well known example is the coverage of the specific rooms of the Greek parliament with glazed tiles in a variety of designs and a panspermia of colors, as you can see here. In the former dining room of the, uh, of the parliament, but also in the president's room, I'm sorry I don't have it here, there is also a president's, uh, uh, I had a slide, I don't know where it's gone, it was in the president's office, where we can see uh, the rich is Nick type tile decoration to be unexpectedly present. And of course, that, that was really a, a surprise I was surprised because it stands in sharp contrast to both the, with the ideological and institutional character of the building and the rest, of course, of the decoration, which consists mainly of archaic motifs. Concluding, um, we can thoroughly understand that interwar Greek poetry consisted the most prevalent kind of applied arts, which shared a lot of aesthetic and ideological changes with the fine arts, and thus contributed in a catalytic way to the configuration of the Greekness concept, which enhanced the idea of national identity for the suffering Greek art and society of the time. Thank you very much for being with me. I think uh, I've got another five minutes, but I don't think it was a problem. That was very um, interesting. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Did you have the chance to watch it thoroughly? Yeah, yeah. It, okay. it looks like it's very comparative art with Istanbul, Byzantine, and Anatolian, and then Greek. Oh, yeah. Very interesting. So, I will, we'll talk about it if you want at the end. Now, let's proceed to the next uh, speaker, um, who is Mrs. Laoshi Chum Garfield. Uh, she's going to talk about uh, um, um, the Hong Kong women, I think, or something. Eh? Uh, the title Hello, of I don't know whether you could hear me. Yes, of course. The, the title of your uh, paper is Analyze Hong Kong Women in the 70s Who Mary Chins, the Woman in Kenzo. Yes, thank you very much. And I am now sharing my PowerPoint with you. So may I know whether you could see this clearly? Oh, I think I'm okay. I'm not sure about that, but but yeah. it's not a full screen, of course. Okay. So, am but I you... correct that you could see the screen now? Yeah. Yes. Of course, we can. Yes. Okay. So, I'm going to start. Yes, the please. Woman in Cancel is a popular Hong Kong fiction written by Mary Chin, the pseudonym of the Hong Kong male writer Peter Deng Xiaoyu. It was first serialized in the year of 1977 in City Magazine, a monthly fashion and lifestyle magazine founded by the author and other forerunners of merging the printing media with visual arts in Hong Kong. Other than characterizing the female protagonist with a luxury fashion brand in the title, the debut release of The Woman in Cancel as a serialized novel in the magazine speaks for its depiction of a contemporary woman pursuing a high-end middle-class lifestyle in the 1970s. Concerning the title of the novel, the incorporation of a fashion label with the female protagonist is far more than an indication of her sensitivity towards clothing and style. Rather, for her awareness regarding appearance and fashion, the reader can formulate the attitude of being financially independent 
it is assured that the adoption of this French brand established by the Japanese designer Kanso Taikala is not a random selection. Comparing with many other luxury fashion houses during the time of the novel, Kanso was a newly risen brand created in the 1970s. This signifies its deviation from classic brand names. The novel, The Woman in Cancel, applies first-person narration to illustrate Mary Jean's consumption lifestyles and strategy of romance, for which a contemporary definition of a successful woman is shaped. In sculpturing Mary's trinity nature as the author, narrator, and protagonist of the novel, it begins with a discussion with an editor of City Magazine on a new column. This arrangement has skillfully explained for the birth of this serialized fiction and at the same time concealed the real identity of the male writer behind. Although the woman in Cancel is set in Hong Kong between the 1970s and early 1980s, the role played by Chinese patriarchal culture upon the characters is relatively insignificant. Rather, the novel captures a westernized generation of young elites in Hong Kong who have been benefited by better education opportunities and broader exposure to foreign culture triggered by rapid economic growth in the colonial era. As mentioned in the novel, the protagonist Mary Chin visits hotel lounges more frequently than dining in conventional Chinese restaurants. While Confucian filial obligations were still governing principles during the time of the story, they are not strictly imposed upon the characters. Based on the observation aforesaid, an up-to-date Western philosophical framework is more appropriate in discussing the characters' contemporary perceptions towards womanhood and marriage. The plot has an illustration on how Eric, who has a love relationship with Mary, has later become the lover of another female character. In this presentation, I extend Ruth Irigari's notion on the exchange of women by testifying the concept on the exchange of men. In This Sex Which Is Not One, Ruth Irigari confirms how Western society is based upon the exchange of women. She adds that this sets up the foundation of the economic, social, and cultural order. Based on this theorization, I attempt to investigate how, in the novel The Woman in Cancel, that the exchange of man is connected to the protagonist's strategy in maintaining her womanhood through satisfying the economic, social, and cultural levels of life. Bruce Irrigary begins the possibility of considering men as objects of exchange among women as the exchange of women being an economic activity is always referred back to men. I initiate that when women have achieved autonomy, the exchange of women would then become acts of their own choice and determination. While Mary is driven by the established social ideology for wanting to get married, her idea of needing a presentable man of a pedagogy kind rather than any man is a manifestation of blurring the, bond the boundary between fantasy and reality. At the same time, her mentality demonstrates the possibility of reversing women's subordination in the contemporary exchange relationship. In achieving the goal of getting the right man, she has repeatedly engaged in love relationships. Though Mary is a member of the educated elite with a promising career and high quality lifestyle, the opening chapter of the novel accounts for her state of unhappiness. Having graduated from the university for many three years and still in her mid-twenties, she has been bordered by the urge of marriage. A research conducted in the year of 1976 on the marriage age of Hong Kong women in 1960 to 1970 provides us with hints on the anxiety of Mary. Driven by better education and career for the gender, more women at the age groups of 15 to 19 and 20 to 24 remained unmarried in the year of 1971, in contrast with the situation a decade ago. However, data concerning the age group of 25 to 29 revealed a different scenario. In this age group, 
the number of unmarried women was record a 5% decrease. This implies that against the social backdrop of allowing women to have more options and greater visibility, they were still expected to tie their knots before they were out of their 20s. As Mary somehow stands at the junction, at the conjunction of two age groups, she experiences the stress of living her single life for the avoidance of spinterhood. Another key factor that assists the understanding of her urgency for marriage is the contemporary definition of successful women in her circle of acquaintances. As Mary introduces her female peers in the novel, she has listed out the academic and family backgrounds, profession and fashion sense. Other than these, she also presents their love relationship. For her introduction of these characters, it can be generalized that no matter how stylish, knowledgeable, or financially viable a woman is, if she has no boyfriend or signs that the relationship is heading towards marriage, she will be looked down upon. As a result of this cultural ideology, single women are forever looking for men who are eligible for marriage. Despite the conventional taboo in avoiding the alignment of womanhood with spinsterhood, the women portrayed are not degraded by their mindset towards marriage. Rather, men could be turned into commodities of exchange. In explaining for the subordinate status of women under patriarchy, Bruce Irrigary investigates how the possession of a woman is certainly indispensable to men for the productive use value that she represents. But what he desires is to have them more. A reversal of this ideology is seen in the novel when the power of women is measured by means of their abilities in possessing men. The patients in the novel such as we used to compete over the number of dolls in our childhood and now we compete over the number of boyfriends. It's an indication of how men have become a relative standard in evaluating women. Therefore, no matter how harsh Mary could be in criticizing her friends, she understands well that she could rise above them simply because of having a stable love relationship and more importantly, a presentable boyfriend. The competition among women is thus a race to find out who could first reach the terminal stage of marriage. Therefore, Mary desires for a more secured recognition of her relationship with Andy through legal declarations, although Mary values her relationship with Andy and has much hope of reaching the next stage of her life with him. Andy does not feel the same. To discuss this, we shall first recall Irrigary's suggestion on the market's value of women. She examines the situations with relevance to the productive with the reproduction of labor power, Therefore, women could only be perceived as identical entities with the same phantom-like reality. Under conventional patriarchy, women could be used to indicate the success of men, as you could see from the quotes here on the PowerPoint. As gender reversal sets in, Andy regards himself as an object in Mary's stunning wardrobe. Her determin his determination of breaking up with Mary is an illustration of that he understands he has been disgraced as a commodity to complete Mary's image as a successful woman. He has pointed out how Mary views him as an object rather than a human with emotional needs. The dilemma occurs as a contemporary view of gender politics and the power of relations give rise to Andy's perception of his degraded world. However, Although Mary holds the idea that she needs a man who would not shame her, but could only enshrine her among her friends, she is viewing the relationship with Andy as an equal one. This also results in her comparison of other boyfriends with Andy in her future relationship. Unlike women in conventional patriarchy who are given to men passively in matters related to marriage, Contemporary women portrayed in a serialized novel have the desire of getting married, but their role is not a passive one. Having separated from Andy, Mary is then pursued by Eric, 
I regard Mary's action of continuously looking for another possible partner for marriage when a relationship comes to an end as an act of swapping. As Eric is incomparable with Andy in terms of his upbringing, financial status, and case, Mary admits that she is a substitute and refers to as an inferior Andy. Therefore, no matter how women in the novel are portrayed as a frustrated group who desperately want to be married, they carefully evaluate the market's value of men in decisions regarding marriage. That a successful woman is defined by means of having possessed a man confirms Irigaray's observation that, quote, woman thus has value only in that she can be exchanged, end quote. However, the novel demonstrates a more contemporary view of placing men as objects for comparison in the market. For instance, Mary compares her ex-boyfriend Andy with the current boyfriend Eric in terms of the eligibility as her future husband. No matter how frustrated Mary is in terms of her desire of getting married, she demonstrates her contemporary quality as a woman with her own individuality. In other words, she would not get married simply because of the fact that she has reached the expected age. Though she has adopted some strategy of pressurizing Andy to get married with her, she differentiates well between her desire for marriage and also the romant and also her romantic vision. Therefore, Eric is a belittled replacement for the absence of Andy. Different from Irigaray's findings that men take the initiative in the matter of exchange, Mary suggests in the novel on the possibility of circulating men among women. While competition among women is the golden rule, it doesn't necessarily mean that women could compete over men. Rather, women may willingly pass off a man to another for a more appropriate match. This can be seen from You've Mary's relationship two with. Okay, thank you. This can be seen from Mary's relationship with Eric, as Mary feels that she is not content with the possibility of marrying Eric, and at the same time, her friend Martha seems to be interested in Eric. Mary generously authorizes Martha to take over Eric. She even encourages Martha forcefully to fight for her own rights. So this shows to us that. No matter how the anxiety of getting married is here, this would not drive a contemporary woman to continue her love relationship with an unsuitable man. While the novel begins with the unhappy situation of Mary as the boyfriend does not propose to her, contemporary women in the novel are portrayed as unique entities who have been shaped by the experience that they have encountered, rather than social cultural conformity. The novel does not deny the fact that women are living in eternal pressure and urges them to marriage. As a married woman, Mimi happily encourages Mary to share the same marital status with her. But Mary knows well how the label of spinsterhood is approaching. This threat is not going to make her forget that she is still a free woman. In a society, a woman at the age of twenty-eight, as you could see from this quote on a PowerPoint slide, who remains single is surely an embarrassing age. People will be shocked, feel weird, mock, sympathetic, or sarcastic. One sure thing is that people would be envious. Other than having the confidence towards her status, Mary also has a self-comforting mechanism in justifying her embarrassing state of being single. Still, she prioritizes the necessity of achieving self-autonomy. It is apparent that women in the nineteen in the in the year in the age of the nineteen seventies in Hong Kong have the abilities to reverse the situation of being objects of exchange, and it is only a matter of their own determination. Thank you very much. This is the end of my presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. It was a really Thank interesting uh, presentation. Um, Let's go to our next uh, speaker. It is um, is it Tamar Kogolaj? Um, around Tamar Kogolaj from the Gore State Teaching University in Georgia. No. Uh, 
Uh, well, I'm not sure. Not here. Uh, he's Google. not. Seems he it. He's not. Google Adze. Say again. Google Adze. Google Adze. Yes. Oh. Is he around? No. So, in case he may come later, I don't know. Uh, let's uh, proceed to our next speaker. Uh, to Mr. Vikram uh, Bardwaj, if I can pronounce it properly, um, from the Government College Teog in India. He's going to present uh, the paper uh, titled The Vanishing for Culture of Western Himalayas, a case study of Shimla Hills. Hello, good afternoon. From good afternoon, evening, welcome. Good, afternoon, good morning, good evening. Uh, I have <laughs> just mailed you that for a day some issue with my system. So I would be presenting a paper, but it would not be a PPT. My system a few minutes ago just broke down. So if it is possible, then I'm going to present if it whether it would be fine. So you're not you're not in a PC now. You're are you using your what? What, I'm what using device a phone. are you using? The phone. Yeah, I'm using a mobile course. phone. My further PC uh, have broke down. Due to that okay. particular reason, further I mail that uh, if possible, can you give me another slot tomorrow, or I would be presenting a, I would be reading my paper. It would be fine. Um, I, I'm not sure about tomorrow because I cannot. I, I'm not uh, a member of the organizing committee. I think that you should okay. use the time your time given today. Okay, no, I, I would be presenting. That's, my you know, I don't think that if he doesn't have PowerPoint slides, uh, would be a problem. We can listen like no, that. That's that's what I well, that's what I think too. So you yeah. we, you can proceed, Mr. Bajwas. Okay, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. The topic of my presentation uh, presentation is the vanishing folk culture of Western Himalayas, a case study of Shimla Hills. Uh, this study intends to highlight the dying cultural heritage of those regions of Western Himalayas, which are inhabited by numerous ethnic and tribal communities and where the un <clears throat> Sustainable modern development has destroyed the life and culture of these indigenous people. The fragile ecosystem of the river valley, mountains and the med meadows have been destroyed either by big dams or by tourism in the name of eco economic development. The history and culture of such communities or groups are rooted in oral traditions and these oral traditions have their roots in the natural habitat where these communities thrive. These people have their distinct social, cultural and religious pattern which share their community life and it and it can only be traced through their folklore. In the modern times, the <clears throat> so-called popular culture is eating away the folk culture and for the economic it, it's it's reproducing it in the form of fake culture. The study is concentrated on Shimla Hill region of Western Himalayas, which is facing such kind of problems. The Satluj Valley, a river valley, which has been altered by the construction of hydro projects, and within the cultural, within this cultural pattern, there has been alteration in each and every aspect of cultural system, whatever we can find. When I uh, further, Himachal Pradesh is situated in the heart of Western Himalayas, is inhabited by numerous ethnic and tribal communities, is and is specifically known for its diverse life and cultural heritage, which is indigenous, uh, which have, which has indigenous people revolve, uh, living in that area from centuries. Due to rich culture, rich culture, this land is termed as land of gods. The whole region is full of mystic vibrance, uh, mystic vibration, and has been. Method, mythologically painted as the land of divine spirits and its divinity has also been elaborated in ancient Sanskrit literature. Himachal is also known as the land of abode of snow. It is a state geographically cut across with mountain ranges, rivers and valleys, deriving the inhabitants into distinct cultural regions which have given birth to several interesting social cultural patterns in which the institution of village god is most remarkable. These institutions have history behind them rooted in the midst of the past, remembered in the form of oral narratives. Perhaps this is the region which makes Himachal as one of the richest India, Indian state in terms of folklore and cultural diversity. Although you know, an administrative unit, it is a cohesive group in name only. The diversity of people in the state makes it impossible to speak eek of its <coughs> folk culture in German journal terms. The <coughs> History and culture of the region goes back to the dawn of human civilization. In its early history is an account of, of migration of peoples of different races from Indian plains and Central Asia. Its history is perhaps most unique and remarkable 
one uh, one as compared with uh, any other region of the himalayas the history of himachal is the history of proto asteroids the earliest inhabitants in this area uh, in the for the vedic tradition of the sanskrit literature they are named in different different terminologies and they were the basic indigenous people of this region at the same time there is another particular group which has migrated to this region near about 2 2000 years ago uh, which 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 were known as khashas and the, which which were the offshoots of the iron race and, for, and due to this particular intermingling of the kashas or the people of central asia with the local people which were living in this area new cultural pattern have emerged and with passage of time the <clears throat> this cultural pattern have emerged and grown with the passage of time shimla when we talk about shimla shimla is uh, the capital as well as the district in himachal pradesh which lies between 70 degree e and 70 degree e east to 78 degree east and the latitude is from 30 degree 40 in 30 degree 45 minutes to 31 degree 44 degree only uh, in 44 minutes uh, north of the uh, north and it is surrounded by a uh, further few other districts and the average altitude of this region varies from 300 meters which is the lowest one and the highest point is near about 6000 meters there is huge diversity ecologically as well as further geographically in this particular region <clears throat> geographically can be divided into three particular regions which can be said as inner himalayas outer himalayas and lower himalayas and due to these this particular division for the ecological diversity as well as cultural diversity can be found in this area the most important thing in this area is the history and culture of this indigenous community or social groups are rooted in our rooted oral traditions i want to talk here about oral traditions the history and culture of indigenous <clears throat> and community or social groups are rooted in oral tradition and these oral tradition have their roots in the natural habitat where these community thrive these people have their distinct social cultural and religious as pattern which shapes their community life and it can only be traced through folklore the same is true with shimla hills here uh, folklore uh, is a legendary tradition contained in the popular popular belief institution practices oral literature art and past time of the mental and spiritual life of the folk here folklore is not merely a reflection of the abstract culture but it exists in everyday life in a <clears throat> in a mean of creating culture the folk culture in the form of rich oral tradition according to one of our eminent scholar um, of this particular area has said that co uh, i quotes it seemed to have served the pop- uh, the purpose that popular literature can fulfill in other societies that uh, unquote and uh, this thing has been uh, what we have seen this thing here as the popular culture in the lower uh, areas of uh, india have developed their own distinct culture the folklore in this particular region have been created their own poor <clears throat> own particular culture even gd bremen and in his work that is hindus of himalayas have quoted the same thing that the hindus or so called the tribal people in these little tribal or the semi tribal people in this particular region have a very distinct kind of culture which cannot be related directly with any particular hindu community of the central particular uh, plain lands of india they they <clears throat> worship differently they are pregnant they uh, they they, um, uh, they practice different uh, traits at the same time they pass they worship their spirits queers and fantastic fantastic demons as and gods and for the worship of stones weapons dye rags and are their symbols sun and the sun the moon and the constellation are their uh, gods and uh, we do not see such kind of similar things in the a lower uh, region of india and just due to this it is a little bit different but uh, the belief in shimla hills constitute the traditional legends rituals and myths and custom of a society they exist as folk knowledge and uh, and are practiced as customary behaviors they do not exist solely in the abstract but they actually exist in practice and behavior which are visible in their rites and ritual performing uh, during the religious festivals alan dunde alan dunde structural um, alan dunde structural definition of folk belief can be related to this area to some extent while butler's view regarding folk beliefs as narratives as memories and legends custom rituals and uh, and uh, rhymes give detail how uh, that how these genres of folklore share a traditional elements with the religious and heroic legends which gives birth to the complex cultural practices followed in the remote corners of shimla hills folk beliefs are often part of the complex cultural processes that involves not only belief 
but also values and other behavior or uh, and the find expression in the genre of folklore all uh, among several interesting social practices prevalent in the hill hilly society especially in place of higher altitude and institution of village god is most remarkable the god and goddesses here are not sitting spectators but are expected to behave like common human beings with sentiments and pride and uh, having a history behind each one of them most of gods have their family members as deities in various villages which have given birth to strong um <clears throat> Strong relation, uh, relation, uh, strong, strong relationship among the different areas. Uh, strong relationship and understanding of the people in their region and diverse cultural practices have come up due to this, which has further influenced the social, social and religious life of the people. The ceremonies associated with them confirm strong roots of collective lifestyle and team and spirit of the people. These practices give the, 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 the give this area a unique cultural pattern, which is quite distinct in each and every aspect. Now, I would be coming directly on. On what is the main issue and why this particular cultural aspect is further vanishing? The folk culture of this uh, and the practices related to this area are slowly and slowly weakening and further heading towards its death. There are several regions in this area. Uh, region. Uh, there are several reasons and for this, and the most important one are development. For specifically, I would be calling unsustainable development. Not only direct development, but unsustainable development. Which is clearly visible in big projects as well as tourism, des tourist destination, and how, in real sense, flock of people are continuously moving to this area, which is very fragile. Further, specifically, Himalayan region is very fragile eco ecologically, and further, government is least bothered, common people are least bothered, no one is bothered, and further, sometimes it gives gives us me pain whenever I see that in a very small area where the carrying capacity of a particular area is near about two thousand or three thousand, and in summers near about twenty thousand people will come to that particular area, and and due to that particular reason, poaching is going up further each and every day. Further, there are there are several uh, peasantry birds in this area, which were very beautiful and life on the in the last twenty years. What have come to what have been seen that now. Their population has dwindled so to extend that further now they might they are on the verge of extinction in one way or another. Snow leopard further in the higher regions, snow leopard is being continuously hunted. Further, ibex is continuously being hunted, and further the best particular uh, animals and at the same time uh, forest uh, flora forest flora is continuously being exploited by the, those people who want money and nothing more than that. Specifically with this also with the tourism, the second particular important biggest problem is with the dams in last 60 years specifically i am talking about only single river i am not talking about major rivers you know on a single river which is known as satloj river which is the main river of this particular region there are several dams bhakra dam has been constructed which is 1500 megawatt then for the karcham one to another dam which is 1000 megawatt Another dam for the Narpa Chakri has been further constructed, which is 1530 megawatts. Further, there are three more dams further, which our construction is going on. And it's something very strange. You cannot see the river in some particular places. The whole river has been tunneled down. And then that river is taken inside the mountain. The hydro project is created there. And that particular uh, further, uh, then further, what are seeing the, and due to that particular reason, mainly for the, Overall, the scenario is worse. At the same time, I want to add one more thing here. Due to this unethical or unethical, I will use the word unethical development or unsustainable development, there is huge migration from the people from the lower area to this area. They are migrating to, first of all, for the sake of job, because there are job opportunities either due to tourism or either due to further development activities. And at the same time, they are also migrating here because climatical conditions suits there. The temperature is very moderate. Further, it uh, further grows at the most 25 or 26 degrees in summer, in centigrade, and lower it dips to five minus five, not less than that. There are no mosquitoes. Climate is very clean. Oxygen, further plenty of oxygen is there. And due to that particular reason, and people are continuously migrating to this area, and the indigenous people, so-called the tribal or semi-tribal peoples, are losing their not even jobs, but at the same time, their precious possession, which we call land, they are losing that land. And in the long run, if they would be losing their land in this manner, further the problem would be there. I want to say one thing, the another cultural heritage, what we call for the temple architectural or temple heritage is also being looted up. Further, in the last at least 10 years, one incident, one, one kind of incident is continuously going on. People would come out from the outside area. They will roam around the temples, the ancient temples near about for the 2000 years 
years or 3,000 years, 2,000 or 1,500 years, and they have for the several uh, stone idols, or at the same time, they have several metal idols there. And it has been said that those particular idols are being stolen by local peoples, and those idols being are then sold. You have the, another so two minutes. Have, you have another okay. two minutes. Okay. And due to that particular reason, that cultural heritage is also being taken out from there. And when these cultural heritage has been stolen away, then in real sense, with the passage of time, they, the people would be rootless and their culture would be for the lost forever. No doubt development is good. And development is good for the sake of the development of the community as well as for the common man. But the big basic question is that what kind of development we basically need? Do we need a development which would stay there for at least 50 years or 60 years? And after that, there would be no development. There would be a kind of a uh, desert kind of a condition or semi-arid condition. Government is not even thinking about that. Neither the common people is thinking about that. Even the academicians are not even talking about that. They want, they are talking about only one thing, that further uh, our GDP should grow, our standard of living should grow. Standard of living is not the ultimate goal. The Basically, the ultimate goal of any particular development should be that in real sense, how happy we should live. As Buddha has said in this, Buddha was from this particular, from the Himalayan region as well as Buddha has said for the materialistic position or money will never give you peace. The peace is something which is inside you and you have to find out that peace within you. And further, if you would be running behind materialism and development, and in the long run, you would be handing over the piece of a land or piece of a earth to you, next generation, which would be useless. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you very much. It was really interesting. However, it was a shame we could not have your photographs. Um, yeah, but I'm very sorry, my system broke down and further due to that reason I'm helpless in real sense. It's, no, it's not, it's not <laughs> your fault. These things happen anytime, especially in this type of um, conferences which are, you know, virtual. Um, anyway, let's uh, um, proceed to our next two um, presenters, but I, I cannot see them around, but I will call their name. It's uh, Mrs. Ala Kurzenkova and Mr. Maxim Kurzenkov from the independent, they, they're both independent researchers from Ukraine, but I don't think they're around, to be honest. I cannot see them in our list. So uh, I think we will proceed to you, Mr. Raup. I think it's your turn. Okay. Let me so, see if... uh, let me just present you. It's Mr. Edward Raup, um, a lecturer at Gore State Teaching University in Georgia. Um, the presentation, uh, his presentation title is On Establishing a Modern Center for Foreign Languages. Okay, now let me see if I can find a way to uh, share my screen. You will, you will take your time. It took me some time as well, so yes, okay. don't worry too much. Where is my screen? I think you should go to that square with the arrow. Oh, the square with the arrow, yes. yes I'll just press it on. A window. Yeah. Uh, got it here. There, there, must, there okay. must be some options. Oh, let's see. Uh, yes, I have it here somewhere. Uh, let me... Give me just a moment and let me make sure I have this screen. Well, while I'm uh, trying to do this, I want to uh, congratulate the university for its uh, 16th um, Silk Road Conference. It is a, uh, a quite a quite a treat here. Is it your first participation here? Yes. Well, I I was here when it started, so. All right. uh, I've been here for a long time. Okay, let me let me see. I have the uh, I have the PowerPoint now, and I need to get back to the meeting. Uh, here's the meeting, and uh, 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 we, we don't have, uh, have it. No, we cannot see anything. I have it honest. here. Okay, can you see it? Yeah. Uh, let me see. Okay. Yes. Yes. See. It's fine better now from the, from the beginning okay well thank okay. you very much thank you uh, you're welcome we just proceed to your 
to you. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. I congratulate the International Black Sea University on this occasion of its 16th Silk Road Conference, and I am delighted to have been associated with this conference since its very beginning, uh, and I have every expectation that it will continue for many more years. I also want to uh, take note of the national holiday here in Georgia, Sveti uh, Svetkova, uh, <laughs> and uh, my name is Edward, and I am a professor of English philology at Gorey State Teaching University. And I am the director of the university's foreign language center. And it's about this latter role that I would like to speak with you today. There are some people, including in the United States, who believe that the study of foreign languages is a frill that is not needed in any curriculum. Julius Nyerere, the great African statesman and father of his country, Tanzania, once wrote, a nation which refuses to learn from foreign cultures is nothing but a nation of idiots and lunatics. He didn't mince words. Mankind could not progress at all if we all refused to learn from each other. Now, to be sure, the teaching and learning of a foreign language is a complex undertaking. There are both quantitative and qualitative questions to be asked and answered. For example, what languages should be included? What is the rationale for including some languages and excluding others? Which foreign languages should be obligatory and which should be electives? How many students are in the population of language learners? Who is available to teach the languages? And what are their qualifications? Are native speakers available? And are such people capable teachers? What are the standards for the performance of students before, during, and after their courses in reading, listening, speaking, and writing in the target language? What measures will be used to evaluate outcomes? These are just a few of the questions that must be addressed by the university. And how will these questions be addressed? Here in post-Soviet space, we have additional challenges. After some 70 years of Russification, we have the vestiges of Soviet occupation. The one-time dominance of the Russian language is waning in 14 of the 15 former Soviet nations. The peoples are demanding other languages, especially English, German, French, Turkish, and others. Now, the motto of the United States, and I am a dual citizen of the United States and Georgia, is a pluribus unum, out of many, one. But here in post-Soviet space, we have the opposite, ex uno, multi, out of one, many. Now, the response of universities in post-Soviet space has been to add foreign language programs to their curricula and to offer introductory courses in foreign languages, most notably, but not exclusively, English. Ken Bain asks the right question to begin this research project. What do uh, any... Yes? I'm, I'm sorry that... Are you uh, sharing the other slides or are you going to stick with the first slides? Um... You're not seeing the, the slides change? No, I don't. I personally don't from here. If anybody else has the same problem? No, yes, yes. we cannot see the, the, the slide change. You cannot see Maybe. the changes? Okay, from, yeah, from your arrow from my laptop, you can just, you know, go down. I you were, mm -hmm. Okay, sorry, join us. No. Uh, okay. Can you see the, the, uh, the hand stopping the people? That slide, xenophobia? No, no, we cannot see it. Well, the that's, that's, there, there you go now. Yes, we can see it now. Yes, we can see no. it now. Okay, but you cannot see the full screen. Is that right? Uh, well, never mind. We, we, yes, we can, but in a smaller scale. Okay. That's okay. <laughs> Thank you for pointing that out. Uh, okay. So, um, 
uh, back to Ken Bain, he asks the right question to begin this research project. What do any of the best college and university teachers do? What can they do uh, to help and encourage students to achieve remarkable learning results? So uh, this is the slide that I'm looking mm -hmm. at now. To paraphrase, what can post-Soviet universities do to help and encourage students to master a foreign language? Our hypothesis is that a well-planned and well-conducted center for foreign languages can make a major contribution toward that objective. Students, prospective employers, and graduate schools increasingly demand mastery of languages used in business and other international enterprises. In the case of Georgia, only about 5 million use the Georgian language in a population of nearly 8 billion. It is imperative that university graduates know languages of other nations. Yes, there is xenophobia and resistance to foreign language learning, but these can be overcome with well-designed and professionally implemented programs. So uh, we are at slide eight. There are many reasons to learn a foreign language and here's a sample of such reasons. We, we can meet new people, give your brain a serious workout, more employment opportunities uh, here and abroad, the gain appreciation for art, the kind of art uh, that we heard in the first uh, presentation, travel easier, more easily and, and less expensively sh uh, to slow the aging of the brain. That's scientifically uh, 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 proven that learning something new and difficult uh, deters uh, dementia. Enhance your English, boost self-esteem, make yourself more interesting, enhance your perspective of life in the world and study or live overseas. My wife and I have lived in or uh, traveled to some 50 countries and without knowing some kind of, of uh, language like hello, goodbye, and where's the toilet, uh, you cannot uh, survive. Well, but perhaps the single most important reason is that our graduates are going out into the wider world and they must be prepared. The research question here is, how can modern management methods help a foreign language center to contribute to effective and efficient foreign language teaching and learning programs in a post-Soviet university? In pursuing an answer to the question, we seek both theoretical foundations and real world applications of theory and practice. The study may offer valuable pathways to support the foreign language programs of universities in post-Soviet space. Um, the, the study employs three methods of inquiry. The premise being that several methods can improve the validity of the analysis and evaluation of current centers of foreign language teaching and learning as opposed to just one method. First, the study examines the statute that established the Foreign Language Center at Gorey State Teaching University, where I teach. The second, the study looks at centers in other European universities. Those like Georgia are signatories to the Bologna process. Third, based on the analysis and evaluation of the Gorey and other centers, we construct a model statute. So, these, these methods, these traditional methods of research in the teaching and learning of foreign languages tend to be top down from teacher to student using rote memory of vocabulary and rules of grammar and little if any exposure to native speakers. A more modern approach will involve students in interactive communication. It will integrate the elements of the language rather than isolate them and it will immerse the students in the language from start to finish. And the experience will be relevant to the lives of the students. Now, we draw on organization theory for the five functions of management, plan, organize, assemble resources, direct and control. It appears that educators and education administrators could benefit from a study of these five functions in detail. What are the results? Well, based on our examination of language acquisition theory 
and practice. And on a survey of other foreign language centers, we design a new regulation. The new regulation is intended to offer students and teachers a foreign language center based on best practices. It is comprehensive from general provisions to procedures for making changes as experience indicates opportunities for improvements. So uh, our uh, discussion, uh, we have uh, uh, these seven uh, articles. I won't go into detail, it would take too much time, but if anybody is interested, I can send our model uh, regulation. So in conclusion, our conclusion is optimistic. We find that a modern center for foreign languages has the potential for improving the effectiveness and efficiency of foreign language programs at the university level. We believe that such a center and its activities also have the potential for increasing enrollments by school leavers. And finally, we believe that a foreign, modern foreign language center will better prepare graduates for the jobs in their globalized future as well as for further education in universities abroad. So with that, I thank you and I'll turn it back to our facilitator. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Rao, for the solid presentation, uh, which was really uh, interesting. And uh, we will talk about it uh, in the discussion time. I think many people have some questions to ask. Either. And let's proceed to our um, final, possibly, a presenter for today, which is Mrs. Marcella Gania uh, from the Artifact University of Bucharest, Romania. Her presentation title is Futuristic China, Futuristic, Short media, China. Futuristic China, Short Media Overview between February 2021 and September 2021. You can proceed to your presentation, uh, Mrs. Kenya. Thank you. Thank you very much for the introduction. I hope everybody can see my PowerPoint. Yep. Yeah, thank you. Um, my purpose of the purpose of my research was to assess how China ranks globally in terms of artificial intelligence and advanced technologies. My research technique consisted in collecting the material, which was a report of research institutes, think tanks, the European Union, the European Parliament, the US uh, Committee on uh, Security Committee on Artificial Intelligence, NASA presentations made by the Chinese delegation at the UN COPWAS, the committee for the peaceful um, exploration of the outer space and a few media sources all of them in english and including the phrases futuristic china china technology and artificial intelligence covering as you said february september 2021 i realized that China is a leader in artificial intelligence and advanced technologies. China is using currently 32% artificial intelligence in industry, as against 20, 22% in the US and 18% in Europe. In February, the Australian-made documentary entitled Futuristic China started to be broadcasted around the world. It says from the very beginning, China is the most ambitious innovator in the world and technology is speeding China's transformation into the world's manufacturing hub and the leading global innovation center. In February, also CNN presented the plans for several new futuristic modular cities with transformable spaces, solar energy and artificial intelligence in China near Chengdu, near Beijing, and the car-free uh, net city near Shenzhen. The design takes your breath away. Beyond the ambition to set new standards in the urban life, it's a solution for, for the growing population in China, because the Chinese authorities estimate that 1 billion inhabitants will be in cities by 2035. 
The March report of the US uh, Security Commission on Artificial Intelligence says that for the first time since the, world, the Second World War, America's technological predominance is under threat. And in April, the same Security Commission on Artificial Intelligence listed China as a strategic competitor to the United States, US peer in many areas, and artificial intelligence leader in some areas. The September report of the European Parliament, entitled China's Ambitions in the Artificial Intelligence, confirms that China ranks the second, the second because it still has to overcome some challenges in terms of talent and production of very sophisticated semiconductors, for instance, but it ranks the first since 2020 in terms of the number of research papers on artificial intelligence and the number of artificial intelligence related pa patents. According to this report, China is now expected to reach the world leading level by 2025 and to become, I quote, the major artificial intelligence innovation center in the world by 2030. In May to, uh, 2021, the European Commission's report on advanced technologies mentioned China as global leader in some of the 12 advanced technologies, such as photonics, security, big data, micro and nanoelectronics, robotics, and also artificial intelligence. Between 2008 and 2018, for instance, the patent applications filed by Chinese applicants increased mostly in artificial intelligence, while the, the EU, for instance, displays a negative specialization in these fields. In August, Nature magazine was describing in detail how the Chinese researchers work on the potential of artificial intelligence in drug design and development. Although the Chinese um, are latecomers, they are currently superseding the United States, the pioneer in this field. And given the conservative thinking in Western countries and the legal restrictions, the Chinese companies may move faster. The huge number of artificial intelligence researchers, because uh, they combine uh, the returnees from the US and Europe, with the veterans of the industrial research at Baidu, Alibaba, and Tencent, and also those being currently trained under the new government programs. And the significant number of the artificial intelligence research paper in China, which accounts for 22.4% uh, of the total, compared with 16.4% from Europe and 14.6% percent from the United States, according to Stanford University, well, all this may result into China's ascendance one day in this field of drug design and development. In 2016, the five-year plan for science and technology introduced the mega programs covering energy, information, aerospace, manufacturing, transportation, materials, and other fields. The mega programs of high definition earth observation systems and manned aerospace and moon exploration promoted the development of satellite and their applications. From 2021 to 2025, China is likely to set up laboratories in several major innovation fields, such as quantum information, photons and micro and nanoelectronics, biomedicine, and many others. There are still two weak points, and uh, Kai Fu Li, the famous author, who writes a lot about the artificial intelligence, states that, for instance, China still lacks uh, scientists who will make fundamental breakthroughs, represented by the top 1% of the papers, especially the highly cited conference papers. And when it comes to really the most creative out of the box thinkers, the US still leads. But China's global innovation index 
is the 14th in 2020 from the 29th in 2007. China is currently the second largest research and development spender close to the US. Now, China is space. China has currently the largest and most dynamic space program. In May 2021, as you know, China's rover landed on planet Mars, making China the second nation to touch Mars. In June, uh, three Chinese taikonauts went on the third of the 11 missions planned to build the Chinese space station due to be ready in 2022. Although smaller than the current International Space Station, it will weight only uh, 90 tons and accommodate only three astronauts at a time compared to the current uh, space station, which weighs about 450 tons. The Chinese space station may be the future because the current one is aging and may be decommissioned by the 2030s. China has plans for the moon too. As you know, in January 2019, it was the first country to land a probe on the far side of the moon. The second mission of the rover sent in uh, 2013, which is still operational. In December, 2020, another Chinese rover was sent to the moon to bring soil and rocks, which it did. Thus, it accomplished the second such mission of collecting lunar samples after the Soviet mission back in 1976. NASA Administrator Bill Nelson and uh, his deputy, the former astronaut Pam Melroy, confirmed in June 2021 that China's extremely pro quick progress in space may result into China surpassing the United States soon. And indeed, in August, during the 64th session of the UN Committee on the uh, Peaceful Exploration of the Space in Vienna, the Chinese delegation presented in detail China's space program, which reflects indeed a wide range of space missions. They presented, for instance, the first stage of experiments on the Chinese space station, and we saw nine projects from 17 countries and 23 entities. Okay, just a second. Uh, I just want to change the slide. Mm -hmm. You will be having and another the, two or three minutes. I, I know, uh, I'm concluding, but it, okay, this is somehow blocked. Technology. <laughs> mm -hmm. And I'll quote only um, uh, some of the titles, uh, for instance, effect of microgravity on the growth of biofilm production of disease causing bacteria with the Peruvian branch and the Spanish branch of the Mars Society. Another project, um, flame instability is affected by the vortices uh, applied by the Chinese and the Japanese scientists. Polarization detection of gamma ray bursts um, applied uh, with Switzerland, China, Germany, and Poland. Harvard Business Review uh, was explaining in uh, May 2021 why China is advancing so fast. And they said, China has now a resource that no other country has, a vast population that has developed an astonishing propensity for adopting and adapting to innovations at a speed and a scale that is unmatched elsewhere on Earth. 700 million Chinese are under the age of 40. 
In addition, China has now a new national identity. It's no longer the only the manufacturing identity of uh, the 90s and the year 2000. It has now this propensity for innovation. Thank you very much for your time. We do thank you very much for your very interesting presentation. And I think uh, at this point that um, we'll be uh, proceeding to the discussion because I, I don't think we're going to get the other two presenters, Mr. Tamar Gogoladze and uh, the couple from, from Ukraine. So uh, I think we should uh, proceed to our discussion sort of time and I'm going to ask you, I hope you're all here. Um, hopefully I'm not sure. Um, I'm going to ask if you have any questions to uh, to the presenters so far. Uh, before asking questions, you know, I would like to thank from the uh, International Black Sea University course, on the behalf yes. of IPSO to all participants because I was listening at the papers were really very, very interesting, you know. So I thank you for you. this and good luck to all. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for uh, yes. being a wonderful <laughs> heart in yeah. um, university. So, um, does anybody have any questions or any sort of queries about uh, any sort of yeah, please. Yes, uh, uh, Johannes. Yes, uh, Johannes, I want I want to clarify on one thing. Uh, we cannot hear you. Uh, can you repeat, or is there any problem with your sound, Mr. Ralph? Yes, um, please, so, please, 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 uh, I know uh, Abdul Malik uh, had had some technical uh, issue. No, it's okay now. Okay, well, so I would love to have a copy of your presentation because mm -hmm. when I teach the Romantic Poets, one of the, the poems I teach is the Ode on a Grecian Urn, uh, mm -hmm. Thou Still Unravished Quiet, oh. Bride of Quietness. And when oh. I saw your your presentation, I, I thought we should have those pictures in my presentation. Uh, so I, I thank you for that. We, we could do that after after it's been published. Uh, I mean, we can always send you some photographs. I mean, we can keep in touch. Anyway, thank you very much for your Wonderful. interest. Anyway, so uh, yeah, they were all very interesting. All of them, all oh. of them different yeah. but interesting in their own field. Each one. Yes, very diverse. Very. Um, Mr. Uh, Abdul Malik, do you want to to ask a question? Yeah, okay. I was going to clarify on one thing that uh, Tamar Gogoladze, her session is transferred to the Georgian session, so you no worry about that. I mean, she will not be here oh, anyway. I'm sorry. So okay, she's but, uh, somewhere else. I mean, she's presenting her paper somewhere else. Yeah, she is presenting in around like a five thirty in different session, which is Georgian session. So she moves from the English session to the Georgian session. All right. Thank you. Uh, and I, I would like to, I would like to um, follow up with the Mr. Edward, uh, his uh, model uh, foreign language center. Uh, uh, IBSU, our International Black Sea University, had that experience before, but unfortunately, we. We we didn't sh we didn't shut but that, I, I think it's bring it down but we can maybe uh, I mean uh, Ms. Teo is here we may uh, as a I am head of the international office here so we can maybe uh, sit down and talk more and to reintegrate uh, it in a new modern uh, approaches what is uh, you know developing like a virtually yes. so we can maybe talk I think uh, there will be great exchange ideas. And, and, and I really, I am happy. Um, I studied political science and I am doing my PhD here in the University of Georgia is foreign policy analysis, but uh, I quite enjoyed each of the sessions and presenter. And I, I think I am, uh, I, I'm really grateful to be here to know from different approaches, uh, like from Tokyo, from the literature, from the other, and your presentation, Mr. Joannes, it was really great, informative and educative. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Mm -hmm. Thank you too. Uh, right, um, I wanted to. Uh, does anybody else have a question or anything more to ask? Whatever, because I want to ask a question actually to to Mrs. Garfield, but she's gone. I'm sorry, I cannot see her around. She has left the session for some reason. Um, uh, so I wanted to ask 
a question to Mr. Uh, Bardwaj. Can, can, can you hear me, Mr. Bardwaj? No? He's probably here or not, I'm not sure. Anyway, I will proceed to, um, to Mr. Raup. And I want to ask a question which is actually um, uh, kind of, um, uh, let's say, um, of your experience, basically. I mean, how long have you been studying, uh, excuse me, teaching English in Georgia? Oh, that's a fascinating question. Wonderful. I came to Georgia in 2003 as a Peace Corps volunteer mm -hmm. uh, at Georgia State University. And I also taught at uh, International Black Sea University. Uh, mm -hmm. In International Black Sea University, the students were very good in English. Uh, they came from uh, Georgia, from Turkey, from Azerbaijan, and they were very, very good. And uh, IBSU was very, very well uh, organized. I also gained an appreciation for the relationship between Turkey and, and Georgia. Uh, Turkish mm -hmm. businesses who started uh, many of the enterprises in Georgia uh, were very, very uh, friendly, very open. The, the rector, uh, uh, everybody, the staff, uh, uh, very, very uh, uh, welcoming. It is not easy uh, uh, teaching uh, another language. For example, I, I, I just mentioned uh, <laughs> You, uh, Johannes, uh, talking about uh, uh, Ode on a Grecian Urn. How do you do that uh, mm -hmm. in iambic pentameter when there is no uh, accent in Georgian, <laughs> right? I mm -hmm. can say da-da, 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 because it's a da-da-da-da-da-da-da. Uh, but uh, a great deal of it uh, has to do with uh, practice. And uh, uh, if we have an opportunity to have native speakers, not just Dana, my wife and, and I, she's right here, uh, but we have other native speakers and uh, they come to Black Sea University, they come to the University of Georgia, which I helped to found with uh, Gyuli Alasania uh, mm -hmm. 15 years ago, a uh, wonderful university. Um, so uh, you, you have to be novel, Johannes, you have to be creative. You have I'm to, sure, I'm sure. And, and we, uh, we also teach uh, uh, children, and I love to teach children. I don't have an opportunity to teach young children very much, but when I do, I, I try to uh, get them to understand that it is relevant. to Not just Jack and Jill went to the store to buy bread, but we have a girl who's interested in fashion design. So mm -hmm. we do fashion design, or somebody's interested in the military. We have the uh, National Military Academy here, and we teach there. So relevance is, is extremely important uh, at every age. Good. Now, but uh, I haven't finished my question yet, but that was quite informative, actually. So when you first came to the country, how do you notice any sort of xenophobia against the Western way of living and the English language. And can you tell us the difference between then and now, after 20 years, almost 20 years, 18? When I first came to Georgia, the street signs were in Georgian and Russian. Now the street signs are in Georgian and English. <laughs> so, mm, that's, what, that's what I thought, actually. Yes. Mm. I gave a, a paper in Warsaw, in Poland, and uh, so the, the uh, students were given an opportunity to hear the translation uh, in English or in Russian. And, and they all came to me and I said, don't you want to hear in Russian? And they said, we don't like Russian. Well, th th there is a, a kind of a reverse xenophobia. Uh, mm. They have been occupied for so long. Um, and uh, uh, you, you don't have that memory, I think, in Greece. No, no, we don't. Your, your parents or grandparents might have, but... Oh, but yes. uh, the occupation um, mm. is, was terrible, and it has vestiges. Yeah, I'm so talking about my generation. No, we don't. Actually, no. possibly the, the older generations do. Yeah. So the young generation here, and it's going to take several generations. Uh, the the mentality. Uh, I often speak about. Uh, you know, you can take the boy out of the Soviet Union, but you can't take the Soviet Union out of the boy. Uh, we have what I call uh, Homo Sovieticus. We have the mindset of the Soviet right. Union. And, and I might say that the uh, introduction by Turkish business people and Turkish educators, that's been very helpful. 
uh, because uh, we can see it in International Black Sea University. Very open. You can do your PhD in English, which mm -hmm. you cannot do in the state university. So a PhD in English in the state university is done in Georgian, if you can oh. believe that. Mm. <laughs> so things have things have changed a great deal in those 18 years. Mm. So, I'm sure, I'm sure they mostly have. Good, mostly yes. good. Thank you very much. Um, does anybody else have any questions to anybody? If not, I'm going to address my last question to Mrs. Ghania. Um, from what you presented, actually, uh, I actually um, found out that China presents a high caliber progress, uh, not only in this uh, um, eight months time, but in the last few years in terms of technology. Um, mm. Um, according to your opinion, um, how can you see China in terms of technology in general um, in comparison to other technologically advanced countries of the world in the next few years? Do you think it's going to be a threat in that field? And do you think that it's going to affect other sorts of um, uh, life, like politics or economy, maybe, or, um, or maybe culture? Politics, economy, and culture. Okay. Um, because th th those will be three uh, separate answers. Thank you for the they question. Are, I think they, they, <laughs> all, they all start from technology nowadays. I mean, they Indeed. are affected by it. Yeah. Mm. Well, um, the answer starts with the title itself. Someone, someone um, asked me, why February and September? Because I found so many very recent reports and I was shocked myself. I we knew that China is advancing, but not so many official reports saying it clearly, not NASA saying it so clearly. Hey, they are almost one step uh, in front of us because um, you see, everything starts from ignorance and from lack of um, inquisitiveness, if you want. Um, a lot of people deal, even in my country, if you watch the TV channel, you can either go crazy or dumb. You become an idiot. There, there are very, very few programs on science and technology. Currently, they used to be in the past. But mm -hmm. let's admit it, a lot of journalists are becoming so superficial. The teachers sometimes themselves are becoming, the, the study programs are becoming so superficial and we're not interested in what matters. We are not looking into the future anymore. I'm doing this. I do TV programs, radio programs. We, you know with whom? With an 80 year old man who's been promoting science and technology for years, for 50 years, maybe more than 50 years, we grew up with his voice on TV. So when I found him, he also liked my interest in China. He was a visionary. He was the only one who realized that China is doing something when we are not interested. And um, we started to dig. I myself as an academic to do research on China because it's very interesting. I found my counterparts, for instance, in uh, the French Academia and in a few, in, in very few in Western Europe. And I'm in touch with them. We go to conferences together. Well, we stopped in December 2019, unfortunately. But we are in touch. We are studying China because the, the, the progress China is doing is amazing. Uh, due to the centralized leadership. If you analyze um, carefully their five-year plan, you can see their ambitions. Now, uh, threat, yes, technology will be a threat in hands of anybody. And terrorism has shown us that in the hands of bad people, technology can become a threat, of course. I don't think China itself 
you know that they are currently talking about um, that concept of resident she uh, common destiny for shared destiny for the for the prosperity of mankind honestly when i realized what means the belt and road initiative connecting people connecting minds exchanging ideas improving um the everyday life in ethiopia you know that countries some countries have seen for the first time railways and metro and um, buses and uh, even Israel. Israel is a very advanced country and they have joint projects to build infrastructure. I'm not so much afraid of China because I understood what they want. They don't forget that during the past 20 years, they took out of poverty 800 million people. For me, this is amazing. And I'm not afraid of China, and I will never, never take over uh, the judgments and the way of thinking of some people who criticize China. I'm not saying that China is a saint, okay? But I'm not saying is is a is is a is a threat. And uh, I remember um, Jose Borrell last year, this year during the high level strategic strategic uh, meeting that they had. They said, okay, is China is a competitor, but at the same time we can take profit and turn everything into. If, if you know how to to negotiate with China. They're very hardworking, they're disciplined, they have ambition, which let's admit it, we lost in the Western world. We're becoming lazy and interested in very futile things. It's a total different thing. Yes, yes. So the, for me, it's a, it's a source of inspiration. And and it has, to, it has to do with the culture because Chinese people have been like that centuries for centuries. Now they, they yeah, but just in, in South Korea as well, South Korea, Singapore, that South Asian uh, part mm. of the world is a bit different. They're yeah, more, so, um, the the way they, yes, yes, very, very, and they yeah. have high, high aspirations and goals. Thank you very much and, for the answer. Oh, have you finished or not? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not saying it only myself. But I remember in February or March, I. Um, attended as well a, an academic conference with the Japanese university and um, they were analyzing just this is just to give you um, part of the the answer and the Japanese academics and researchers were analyzing why they lost the second place you know they were the second um, most uh, powerful economically speaking uh, country and they were analyzing very objectively why we lost the second place is now it's china the second and you know what their conclusion was uh, what i just said uh, they are the japanese are now in a in a comfortable situation they um they are um pleased with what they achieved Second, they don't communicate to each other, and there is no um, very strong uh, centralized uh, leader uh, coordination, and that's why they lost the second place. It's not that they, they are not advanced; they're still very advanced. But a few details make the difference between China and Japan. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your very nice uh, presentation. Thank you. Um, have you got any other sort of uh, questions? <coughs> no. Uh, I can give uh, um, Mrs. Uh, Vice Rector for Education Research. Would you like to say anything? No, just I wanted to say um, a great thanks to all participants because papers were really very, very interesting, you know. Very interesting. Discussion is really very interesting. So uh, it seems that, you know, as uh, our speakers are uh, proving, you know, countries, some countries are really eager to develop more in practical way. And uh, as our speaker just mentioned here, countries became quite different, you know, from uh, they have different strategical goals. And China agreed that Chinese people are really very, very hardworking. Uh, they aim to 
become, you know, one uh, um, uh, among one in the leader countries, and that is really big ambitious. And uh, I appreciate, you know, this um, wish. Uh, that's why I thank you very much. On the thank behalf you, of International Black Sea University, I would like to thank you as a moderator because this session was really very interesting to me. And uh, I hope that you will well. enjoy, yes, enjoy your uh, sessions and uh, good luck in your future career and uh, educational life. Thank you very much. And all. I hope next year we'll be able to come and see you in Georgia. Yeah, of course, of course. You know, as uh, as uh, generally, you know, all countries started vaccinated. We are also uh, just following this tendency and I hope that um, just borders will, will will be opened and we will see each other in Ipso. So we will mm -hmm. be more than glad to host you physically in Georgia and to just go around because we have a really very beautiful country with very, very mm -hmm. delicious cuisine. So we would be more than happy, really. <laughs> and you are very warm people as Thank well. You. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much for, uh, for everything. And so I think us? the session has ended. Yes, please. Jonas, I also like to mention that you know we are um, partner university with the West Attica University, and I think one so. Of our, yes. We talked about yeah, it last of, year, but you disappeared. Yeah, yeah <laughs> we are uh, we are sending you uh, our program coordinator of tourism next, I think, session next semester. So I am uh, in contact with uh, uh, Fanny, and he is. Uh, uh, how do you pronounce? I don't know. Oh, it's like a F A N I. Yes. From. Mm, so we are we in, we are in contact, and then we are Erasmus partnership, and that's great. So mm. um, thank you for so that. As I well. may be able, I may be able to come through the Erasmus program to see you sometime. That would be great. great. Please, that's great. Yeah, yeah. and yeah, we could do nice. joint uh, projects. Yes, Malik Bay, joint projects, and maybe joint research with students. Why not? It would oh, be yes, really very good we're, for we're us. Yeah. Yes, of course, yes, of course. We, and, uh, I've got mm -hmm. so many interesting things to tell you. Mm -hmm. Especially sure, yeah, about we are also, design, which is my specialization. Nah, that will be wonderful, yeah. That we are in contact with the um, so international office, and then we can actually send mm -hmm. more, uh, you know, uh, proposals. So we are open. We do have, like, open window policy <laughs> for oh, um, international welcome. networking. Yes. Yeah. Okay. And I just much. share my email uh, from the um, international office. Anyone who wants to collaborate with us, maybe online, maybe lecture, you know, on-site lecture, please send send your email to us. So we, we are delighted to discuss with um, our vice director for education and other top management. So we mm -hmm. are also very open to that opportunity as well. Mm -hmm. well yes, could have done right. last year. I mean, even, even um, via internet, we can do it. I mean, um, um, it's easy now to um, make some sort of, uh, sort of um, let's say oral workshops or something like that. Definitely. And, uh, so I'm interested. Uh, if you if you want, we can keep in touch and arrange something on that base. Yeah, please. Um, you know, I will. Um, I will email you about what we just you know wrap up, and maybe we can discuss through the emails. And I have yes, your email, course. so we'll send course, you the email. Thank you. Of course. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you. So uh, I hope to meet with all of you again next year. Thanks very much for being with us tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good luck. You. And the conference is continuing tomorrow, so you're welcome to attend. You can sessions. join to other sessions also. Yes, Mary. Oh, yes, of course, of course, of course. Join to other yes. sessions. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Mm -hmm. Thanks a lot for giving us this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, too. Thank you, too. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.